Okay, greetings and nice to res resume our discussion on angular momentum in quantum mechanics. And we are going to talk about the SU2 and the SO3 groups today. We will also talk about angular momentum matrices. And the question that we discussed last time was this that you have j square and j z which can be simultaneously measured and the eigenvalues of j square are h cross square j into j plus 1. Or what kind of values can j take? And we learned that j can take 0, half, 1 and so on, half odd integers as well. And for each j, m can take 2 j plus 1 values going from minus j to plus j in steps of 1. We learned that. And we got it by simply working with the commutation relations simply the fundamental commutation relations which define angular momentum. We did not put much else, no additional postulates, no additional you know mathematics or no additional physics, no additional quantum mechanics. It was mostly this and a little bit of common sense, which is unfortunately not very common, but that is that's about what all that we put in. right? And we got these results that j can be 0, half and so on. And this has something to do with the fact that we should understand what we mean when we say that the electron has got spin half. So, we got half quantum numbers, but we did not use any relativistic quantum mechanics. We did get half integer angular momentum only from non-relativistic quantum mechanics and only by using angular momentum algebra. Now, this gave us the half hour integer quantum numbers all right, but it does not mean that we get electron spin from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. It would be misleading to say that one can get electron spin from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay? I want to emphasize this point, because I have had students who have sometimes been confused by this issue, because they do get half integer quantum numbers from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And I would like them to understand that this does not mean that you get the electron spin from non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you cannot. You will get the electron spin as half angular, uh, as half h cross only from relativistic quantum mechanics, you must use Dirac equation. It is a consequence of the special theory of relativity. It is based on the fact that Galilean transformations are no good. You have to use Lorentz transformations. It is because the speed of light is constant. So, these are the things which go into the Dirac equation. And unless you do that, which is what we will do in unit 3, we will do it systematically and we will find that the electron spin comes neatly out of it. What it also means is that if you are talking about an electron at rest or moving at the speed at which you walk or even I walk which is like a thousand speed at which you walk maybe, right? at any low speed if you are talking about the electron spin there is no escape from relativistic quantum mechanics. You cannot say that you can you are going to use relativity only if you are dealing with very high speeds, okay? because an electron at rest exists along with its charge and mass and along with its intrinsic angular momentum, which can come only from relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay? So, the consequences are built into it. And uh, sure enough, you do need Lorentz transformations when you are dealing with you know objects at high speeds, but then even if you are dealing with objects at low speeds, if you are talking about phenomena such as electron spin angular momentum, then you do really need a relativistic formalism to be consistent. One can always plug in things in an ad hoc manner, but that is not how it comes systematically. 
and the discovery of electron spin is really very interesting and uh, we know that electron spin is very closely associated with the Pauli matrices and Pauli introduced a two valued quantum number. This was in the connection of assigning quantum numbers to different atoms in a periodic table. That you have the periodic table and how do you fill in the electron sh you know shells. All of you have heard about the off bore principle. Okay. So, 1 s 1, then 1 s 2, and then 2 s 1, 2 s 2, 2 p 1, 2 p 2 and so on. Right. So, you go on filling till the shell is filled and you had to do it in some kind of systematic manner and to explain the filling of electrons in various shells in the periodic table. Pauli came up with a two valued quantum number. He said that n l m n l and m do not suffice to explain the filling of electrons in the periodic table and you must have an additional quantum number which can take two values. Now, he did not say that these two values must be plus half and minus half. He did not say that this refers to electron spin. He just said that there has to be an additional quantum number which must have two values. Okay, those two values could be alpha and beta, x and y or whatever. These are two quantum numbers and they must be invoked to explain the periodic table. Now, this was Pauli in 1924 and he really had no idea at that time about the electron spin as a half angular momentum. And this idea had to wait till it was proposed by two experimentalists, Ullenbeck and Goudsmith. And what they did was to propose the electron spin in 1925 and associated with this a magnetic moment. The reason they did it is because they were trying to explain certain anomalies in certain spectra that they had observed and to introduce this they tossed this idea. It came from nowhere, a brilliant intuition you might call it and they proposed that there has to be an electron spin. It was so much out of the blue that Ullenbeck actually called his like abracadabra jadu toner, okay? that it just comes from somewhere, but it works. Okay, there was no model, no theory to explain that and uh, Goudsmith says that it was some kind of a numerology. It is a miracle that we arrived at the correct expression, which later could be derived from quantum mechanics. So, it just came out of nowhere. This was in 1925 and very often we assign these pictures to the idea of electron spin, which are all wrong as I mentioned earlier as well that there is no classical analog to any of this okay, or any of these pictures. And I will also like to draw your attention to a letter which was written by Thomas to Goudsmith and this letter is available on the internet. If you just Google, I am sure you can find it and I downloaded it, copied it from there. And what Thomas wrote to Goudsmith is that I think you and Ullenbeck have been very lucky to get your spinning electron published and talked about it before Pauli heard of it. It appears that more than a year ago, Kronig believed in the spinning electron and he worked out something and the first person he showed it to was Pauli. Pauli ridiculed the whole thing so much that the first person became also the last one and no one else heard anything of it. So, that was Pauli's response to a suggestion which came from Kronig, which was before Goudsmith and Ullenbeck proposed it and then later in 1927 Pauli introduced the 2 by 2 matrices which we call as Pauli spin matrices which are connected with the electron spin as all of you know from your first course in quantum mechanics and we are going to meet them today as well. And then in 1940 Pauli proved the spin statistics theorem which is very easy to state and very difficult to understand that particles with half integer spin are fermions and particles with integer spins are bosons. Okay, Feynman says in uh, his lecture somewhere that this is one of the few theorems in physics which can be very easily stated and extremely difficult to prove and to understand, but that is a different story altogether. And then in 1928 
Dirac came up with the relativistic formulation of quantum mechanics and the electron spin comes very neatly out of it as we will rediscover in unit 3. So, the electron spin is a reality, it has got two states and the experimental verification um, came before all of this, it was known in an earlier experiment done by Stern and Gerlach, that when you pass silver atoms in a magnetic field, they sort of spread out, okay, they come out and this experiment is known to most of you and this comes from the spin angular momentum of the outermost unpaired electron in silver atom. It belongs to the group 1, so it has got the n s 1 configuration, outermost configuration and that n s 1 is unpaired. So, there is a single electron and it is the magnetic moment of this unpaired electron, which provides these two states in the magnetic field. Now, if you did this experiment with electrons, instead of silver atoms, you send in a beam of electrons, okay, you have an electron gun and you fire it in a stern gelrack magnet, they do not separate out as up spin and down spin. Okay. The reason it does not happen is that electrons are charged particles, silver, silver atoms are neutral particles. Okay. So, when you send in a silver atom, the outermost electron has got a magnetic moment which interacts with the magnetic field, but when you send in an, an, an electron, the electron being a charged particle also experiences the Lorentz force, which is charge times v cross v, right. The char force, Lorentz force on a charge is q into v cross b. So, the v cross b term, which is an additional force on the electrons, which is not there on the silver atoms. Silver atoms are neutral, so q is 0, but for the electron, q is the charge of the electron. So, there is this additional force and then there is a little complicated, not so complicated if you sit down to work out the algebra, but I would not spend time detailing it, but I will just mention the result, that when you work out the consequence of this Lorentz force, the charge times v cross b and try to play the consequences in a formalism, which is consistent with the uncertainty principle, then it turns out that this kind of separation is not possible. So, this argument you can find out in some of the books, I will be happy to share some references. Um, but we will, you know, shelve the historical, you know, narrative on this and pick up the discussion on the electron spin orbital, which has got a two state and you have got the spatial coordinate r and a spin coordinate zeta and you write this as a spin orbital. This is the orbital part and this is the spin part, sometimes called as a spinner and this has got two states represented by c 1 and c 2, which are the coefficients of the two pure states that the electron spin can have. The pure states are either alpha or beta or 1 0 and 0 1 or up and down or whatever you call it. Okay, these are two states and this is your spin wave function or the spinner as it is called and the angular momentum of the electron, which is associated with the spin is referred to the S u 2 rather than S o 3 and I'll, I will tell you why you have to have this difference. So, S u 2 is another group, it is a unitary unimodular group of 2 by 2 matrices. S O 3 you have already met in the context of rotations generated by components of the angular momentum vector, right. And these two groups are homomorphic, which is why they have some similar properties and they are important to us, but they are not isomorphic. Okay. There is a certain similarity and uh, I will demonstrate the relationship and um, we can do it in the context of understanding um, SO3 and SU2 or we can also have a look at O3 and SO3 and you know some of these group properties become relevant for our, our understanding. And let me remind you that you deal with orthogonal matrices 
in the case of rotations. And these matrices will have determinants which are either plus 1 or minus 1. And for the case of SO 3, you pick that subset of matrices, those rotations, those matrices whose determinants are plus 1. Okay, that is what makes it special orthogonal group. Okay, that is what refers to the S in SO 3. Okay. Now, you can have a similar story for the O 2, which also has got explicit representations, which you can see very easily. And you can see that the determinant of cos theta minus sin theta sin theta cos theta is plus 1. Whereas, if you have the 1 1 element with a minus sign, then you have the determinant to be minus 1. So, if you take the subset of those matrices, which have got the determinant to be plus 1, then you get the SO 2. So, so, these are very simple relationships that we are working with in the context of SO 2 or SO 3. And uh, this is what makes our group special that you are picking a subset. So, now when we deal with rotations, our infinitesimal rotation is generated by the angular momentum operator. We have identified this operator in our unit 1. We know that it is 1 minus i over h cross delta phi dot j, delta phi being an infinitesimal angle which is a vector. Finite angles are not vectors, infinitesimal angles are vectors. Okay. Now, what are you going to do when you work with finite rotations? Now, you can express a finite rotation theta, this is no longer an infinitesimal rotation, but you can take a finite angle theta, break it into 9 piece into n pieces, so that each piece is tiny. Okay. And then, let this operate n times and let n tend to infinity. Now, what you are doing is to break it into such tiny pieces, that you will have infinitesimal rotations, which you have no difficulty with. Okay. And this series sums up to this exponential series. Now, I have been careful not to put a vector bar on theta, I write it rather as the magnitude of theta times a unit vector, because I do not want to recognize the finite angle theta as a vector. Okay, so, I write it as a product of a number times a unit vector. So, it has got a certain mathematical sense that we understand through this limit n tending to infinity of the operator of infinitesimal rotations acting n times n tending to infinity. So, that is the mathematical sense that we are all comfortable with. Now, these angles can be changed continuously, which is why they belong to the Lie group. And you can work with this algebra for finite rotations. And now, if you consider this finite angle to be 2 pi, now, 2 pi is of course, a special angle, because we always think that okay, when you take any object and turn it through 2 pi, you are going to recover the original state. right? That is your expectation. So, you take this angle theta to be 2 pi, and look at this operator for finite rotation through angle 2 pi. So, now this is theta is 2 pi let us say it is about the z axis. So, this unit vector theta caret is E z unit vector. And now, you have 2 pi times the j z operator, which is the z component of the angular momentum. Now, this is cosine 2 pi j z over h cross minus i sin 2 pi j z over h cross. And if you operate this on angular momentum eigenstates, you know that j square j z have got simultaneous eigenstates, that you have the eigenvalue equation satisfied by these operators. So, you can operate by these operators on angular momentum states, 
and you will get the corresponding eigenvalues. The eigenvalue of J z is m h cross, which in the case of rotations, j are integers okay, like the orbital angle of momentum, right. These are integers. m goes from minus j to plus j, so they are also integers. So, this rotation operator through 2 pi is equal to the unit operator 1 as one would expect. Yeah? Now, this is the story coming from SO 3. SO 2 is different in this respect. Let us see how. Now, SO 2 is a set of all unitary unimodular matrices which are 2 by 2. The poly matrices are classic cases. In fact, they give you a basis for any 2 by 2 matrix along with the 2 by 2 unit matrix. So, if you have any unit, any 2 by 2 matrix, any matrix does not matter what, you can always write it as a linear superposition of the 3 poly matrices and the 2 by 2 unit matrix. Okay, that is what is meant by a basis. So, you can always write any 2 by 2 matrix in terms of these matrices. And if you refer to a certain spin orbital, you now you know what a spin orbital it is, it has got a spin part and an orbital part. The two component function is called as a spinner and these are the two components. Here the position vector r is with reference to a certain coordinate system, which is E x, E y, E z, which is the Cartesian coordinate system. Now, what would happen if you refer the same spinner, the very same spinner to a different coordinate system, which is rotated with respect to the previous one. Okay. So, we have the spinner, two components and we refer the spinner now to a different coordinate system, which is rotated with respect to the previous one as I have shown in this figure. And the new coordinate unit vectors are E x prime, E y prime, E z prime. The new spinner is obtainable from the first spinner by my matrix multiplying it by this 2 by 2 matrix xi eta lambda mu. Okay. All of these are complex numbers. So, you can, but these are unitary matrices. So, they will satisfy this relation that the joint is the same as the inverse that is what makes them unitary and they also have modulus 1, they belong to the SU 2. So, you do have four equations here that u dagger u must be equal to 1. Okay. And you also have another constraint since the modulus of u is equal to 1. So, out of the 8 real numbers that you work with in 4 complex numbers, each complex number has got 2 real numbers. The imaginary part is as real as the real one. right? So, you have a fifth condition and you really have only 3 parameters as one would expect. And the, these are the matrices that you invoke when you are dealing with angular momentum with half odd integer like the electron spin. That is described by S u 2 and not S o 3. So, let us take this electron spin which is half h cross sigma, sigma being the poly matrix vector. And if you now look at the generator for rotations using the same relationship, but now for j equal to half. Okay. So, now this j is half h cross sigma. Now, let us see the fun. This is really interesting, because you have done the same thing for the rotation operator now. The h cross cancels, you now have theta over 2 times this. And if you now take the same finite angle 2 pi, which you had taken earlier, take theta equal to 2 pi. So, this angle theta by 2 becomes 2 pi by 2 and then sigma dot E z will give you sigma z. Okay. 
what you get is cosine and sine of pi times sigma z. Sigma z you know what they are 1 0 0 minus 1 right. So, you get the cosine and sine over here. So, you get cos pi and 0 and 0 and cosine pi. So, you get minus 1 times the unit matrix. You have rotated through 2 pi angle, but you do not get the unit operator. You get minus 1. And if you want to recover the original state, then you need a rotation through 4 pi, because if you do it twice, then minus 1 into minus 1 is plus 1 even in atomic physics. Right? So, you have to carry out this rotation twice, and this is what distinguishes SU 2 from SO 3. Now, you can see it in another fashion, same result essentially. You go ahead and replace this operator by the j z operator and get its eigenvalue which is m, but m now for spin half is either plus half or minus half and you get essentially the same result that this operator for 2 pi rotation will be minus 1, it is the same thing. Okay and you will need to rotate this state through 4 pi to get plus 1. What it really means is that when you are dealing with half integer quantum numbers, you need to work with SU 2 or else with SO 3. And states of particles with half odd integer spin will require a rotation through 4 pi, which is a problem in Schiff's quantum mechanics or many other books in quantum mechanics, you know, and it is very easy to show the result. It also means that half of the matrices that can be used to represent this rotation operator, they are double valued with respect to this angle theta, okay, because you need two of them. So, you can have identical rotations through angles theta and also through theta plus 2 pi which correspond to different matrices. So, that will happen and this is not a problem, because you really deal with quadratic quantities in terms of the state vectors. So, this normally does not lead to any problem, but so far as our understanding of the phenomenology is concerned, it is certainly important. So, there is a homomorphism, not isomorphism between S u 2 and S o 3. The 3 by 3 unit matrix would correspond to both the 1 1 2 by 2 matrix of the S u 2 as well as the minus 1 unit matrix of the S u 2. Okay, so, there is this correspondence and it means that every representation of S o 3 is also a representation of S u 2, but not vice versa, okay, because you do not have a 1 to 1 mapping. We will discuss the matrix representations of angular momentum operators now, and you will see very soon that this is very simple, but also extremely important, and it will be impossible to highlight how important this really is, but you will certainly see it today. So, these operators we have introduced earlier in our unit 1, uh, these are the step up and the step down or the raising and the lowering operators, in terms of which you can write the operators j x and j y. So, we also have these matrix elements for j plus and j minus, which we have used in unit 1. So, I will use this result straight away. Okay. Likewise, you have the matrix element of j minus as well. And if you get the matrix elements of j plus and j minus, then since j x and j y are expressible in terms of j plus and j minus, you can get the matrix representation of j plus and j minus. So, this is always how you go about getting matrix representations of j x and j y. j z is easy, because j z is diagonal along with j square, but j x and j y are not diagonal and you should get them first in terms of the ladder operators and then 
use this straightforward relationship to get the corresponding representation for j x and j y. So, now for spin half you have got a 2 by 2 uh, matrix representation, there is a two dimensional basis. The first quantum number is the j which is half, the second quantum number is the m quantum number which is plus half or minus half. So, you have got a two dimensional basis here. So, let us get the matrix representation of various operators, j square is very easy because it has got an diagonal representation, you know what the eigen value is which is h cross square j into j plus 1. So, half into half plus 1 will give you 3 by 4 and similarly j z is also diagonal. So, it has got an eigen value equation whose eigen values are either plus half or minus half times h cross. So, you write the matrix representation in this basis of j square, write the 1 1 element, the 1 2, the 2 1 and the 2 2, that is it, you get it all. And using the matrix elements and the ortho orthogonal relationship of the basis set, you get the explicit matrix representation of j square and likewise for j z. What about j plus? Now, before we get j x and j minus, we will first get the matrix representations of j plus and j minus. And we know how to do that, because we have met these matrix elements. So, you get 0 in 1 1, 2 1 and 2 2 positions and only 1 2 is non 0. You plug in the value, which you already have and you get an explicit matrix representation of j plus, which is h cross times 0 1 0 0. Similarly, you get the matrix representation of j minus by doing exactly the same kind of algebra. And once again, you have the other relation for the step down operator and using that, you get the matrix representation for j minus which is h cross 0 0 1 0. Now, you have the matrix representations of j plus and j minus both. So, you can get the matrix representations of j x and j y. So, j x turns out to be h cross by 2 0 1 1 0 and j y is h cross by 2 0 minus i i 0, which is where the polymatrices come in. Okay, so, these are the polymatrices, the sigma z, sigma x and sigma y and you must keep track of all the attributes of the angular momentum, the quantum nature, the vector nature, the operator nature and now also the matrix structure. Okay. So, whenever you deal with these operators and that is what you are going to do a lot in unit 3, you must keep track of all of these attributes, the, mat the matrix structure, the vector structure, the operator structure and the quantum structure all of this. Nothing that you do can be inconsistent with any one of these features. What about j equal to 1? So, now you have got a three dimensional basis, because for j equal to 1 m will take three values minus 1, 0 and 1, there is nothing new about it. And you can get the matrix representations of all the operators j square, j plus, j minus, then j x, j y, everything right. And I will like you to do this for yourself and obtain these explicit matrix representations for j equal to half, j equal to 1 and for some other angular momenta just to get used to it for j equal to 3 half for example. Okay, now, you will have a four dimensional basis, because m will go from minus 3 by 2 to plus 3 by 2 in steps of 1. So, minus 3 by 2, minus half, plus half and plus 3 half. So, you will have a four dimensional basis and you will have 4 by 4 matrices. So, the size of the matrix also goes on increasing and these are the angular momentum 
um, in, in the angular momentum eigenbases, these are the matrix representations of the rotation group. So, this is the rotation group and you can obtain its matrix representation in a basis which is 2 j plus 1 dimensional. These matrices are known as Wigner D matrices. Okay. And the Wigner D matrices are matrix elements of the rotation operator in angular momentum basis sets. They are very simple to obtain for any value of j. We just saw how to get them. These are extremely important Wigner D matrices as they are called. And they will all be 2 j plus 1 by 2 j plus 1 matrices. Their size will grow with j and the reason they are important if it had not occurred to you yet is that you would have seen them on the cover of Sakurai's quantum mechanics book. Okay? And that book deals with so many topics in quantum mechanics. And what they pick out of all of that to be placed on the cover are the Wigner D matrices. So, they better be important and they certainly are. Okay. You will find that you need tremendous expertise in dealing with these matrices. You will need tremendous competence and if you have difficulty dealing with angular momentum algebra and commutation properties between angular momentum operators and lens operators and so on. Here is a classic book which is used all over the world and it is telling you that please learn this carefully, thoroughly, have a good handle on this. Okay? That is precisely what this cover is telling you, it is speaking to you now. Okay? So, please develop tremendous competence and comfort with the algebra of angular momentum operators, angular momentum eigenstates, the lens operator because SO 3 is a subset of SO 4, which is the correct symmetry of the hydrogen atom. right? And I made an attempt to introduce you to these topics, expertise you have to develop on your own. Okay. So, I guess I will stop here today and we will continue the discussion from here tomorrow. If there are any questions, I will be happy to take. The electron spin and the silver atoms. Yes, the silver atom, this is with reference to the Stern Gulrak experiment. Now, what happens is when you put a magnet in a magnetic field, it aligns itself along the magnetic field, which is what you do in a magnetic compass that you might wear on your wrist. Okay? Now, when you talk about classical magnets, you always think that they align themselves exactly along the magnetic field. That does not happen with real magnets, which are essentially quantum. Okay, because the quantum magnets have got a magnetic moment, which is proportional to the angular momentum. And the angular momentum is such an observable, that you cannot get all the three components of this vector observable. You can get only one of the component along with its size, which is given by j square. The size is given by j square, and one component is given by the eigenvalue of j z. When you perform this measurement, the system collapses into an eigenstate of j z and that is what you measure, but then it is not in simultaneously in an eigenstate of j y or j z or j x. It is an, in an eigenstate of j z. Right? Now, you can have these two orientations for j equal to half. 
because m goes from plus half to minus half in steps of 1. So, the silver atom has got one unpaired electron, it is got it is like n s 1, it belongs to the first group and this unpaired electron has got a net magnetic moment. So, this magnetic moment can align itself either along you know with it will have two eigenvalues which is the plus half and the minus half and these are the two components which get separated out when you send a beam of silver atoms through the Stern-Gilroy magnet. Now, so far so good. Now, if you do the same with electrons, the electrons do have this magnetic moment and the mu dot b coupling will give you the same kind of result, but that is not the only thing that is happening to the electrons. Because in addition to this, the electrons have got some difference with the silver atoms, the difference is in the charge. The silver atoms are neutral particles, there are how many 47, what is the atomic number? I had it on the slide actually, I believe it is 47. So, there are as many protons in the nucleus as the number of electrons in the atom. 47, it is written here in the middle of the atom. The number of protons is 47, the number of neutrons is 61. Okay. So, the 47th electron is outside, that is the unpaired electron, which is giving you the magnetic moment, but the atom on the whole is electrically neutral. There are as many protons in the nucleus as the number of electrons outside it. So, it is a neutral atom with a net magnetic moment when you send in a beam of electrons, you have charged particles with a magnetic moment and the charged particle responds to the magnetic field also through this q into v cross b term, which the silver atom will be insensitive to, because the silver atom the charge q is 0. So, there will be no q into v cross b force on the silver atom, but you will have that force on the electrons. Now, Kessler has got a book. I believe the title is Electron Spin by Kessler and in the very first few pages, Kessler discusses this, that when you consider this phenomenology of the Lorentz force on electrons together with this stern gulrak effect, which the electrons will also experience, because they do have this magnetic moment, but in addition to that they experience this Lorentz force. So, the combination is also constrained by the principle of uncertainty. That is fundamental to every process. So, the combined effect of the Lorentz force and the uncertainty principle on the electrons is that they do not separate like this. So, that is a little bit of algebra which you can find in Kessler's book. Any other question? So, thank you very much.